This BBC book, including over 80 specially commissioned colour photographs, provides an additional perspective on the monarch and complements the programme, which is also available as a commemorative video. The BBC presents the Olympic Games. The grace and power of the Winter Games, live from Albertville in France. The skaters, the skiers, striving for medals or just striving. The BBC, the best place to enjoy the Games. The Olympic Winter Games, starting Saturday, BBC One. After the news, it's question time, and I can tell you there's no shortage of questions. Around the table, with as usual no advanced knowledge of the questions selected, will be the former Health Minister Edwina Curry, Patricia Hewitt, who was Neil Kinnock's press secretary at the last election, Founder of the SDP and now Harvard Professor Shirley Williams, and one of the top women in British business, Eve Newbold. An hour of lively debate not to be missed. Question time in half an hour on BBC One. Now on one, the main evening news at 9.50 with Martin Lewis. The Prime Minister personally invites Ulster's leaders to security talks at number 10. He says that after the latest killings, politicians must lead the search for peace. An inquiry into why almost a thousand cancer patients were given the wrong doses of radiation. And the stolen document that led to Paddy Ashdown's confession. A man is arrested. Good evening. John Major stepped into the maelstrom of Ulster politics today with an invitation to the leaders of the province's four main political parties. He invited them to join him and the Northern Ireland Secretary, Peter Brook, in talks to try to stop the indiscriminate terrorist massacres which have reached a new intensity in recent weeks. The initiative was welcomed by Labour's Ulster spokesman, Kevin McNamara. It will be the first time for 16 years that a British Prime Minister has personally taken part in such discussions. Our political editor, John Cole, reports. John Major's talks on security next week face one huge problem. His government's perception of the reality of terrorism in Ulster conflicts sharply with that of politicians who live there. He knows unionists believe escalating violence can only be stemmed by internment of those who run paramilitary organisations. But at question time, he irritated them by endorsing the importance of the political talks which recently broke down. Does he really believe that if the politicians in Northern Ireland at this moment were sitting at a table, that the awful atrocities that we have witnessed in the past few days would not be taken place? The Prime Minister's talks next week will concentrate on security, but he repeated his belief that Ulster politicians should talk together about peace. Mr Paisley retorted that Westminster had taken charge of security 20 years ago, so it must not blame Ulster politicians for its failures. A senior Tory sounded a solemn note. The province is quite close to sliding into civil war between the communities, and if so, the security forces will find it difficult to hold the ring between. Did the authorities know who the Godfathers were and why did they reject internment? Yes, of course it is the case that a significant number of those engaged in terrorism are, are known uh, to the security forces, but it, but, it, but it is also worth remarking that between 40 and 50% of those who are charged with terrorist crimes have no previous terrorist traces. A nationalist MP addressed the terrorists directly. Nothing will ever be achieved through violence except the suffering that they have heaped on Northern Ireland. Have they the courage to call it off? The Prime Minister will take the Ulster party leaders into his confidence about changes in security. But mostly he'll just listen because it's their constituents who are being killed in increasing numbers. So far, Whitehall is saying that the drastic breakdown in public order which would justify internment is far off. But Peter Brook also reminded MPs today that its introduction requires surprise. The loyalist paramilitary group, the Ulster Defence Association, has said the IRA's attacks against Protestants must stop if the cycle of violence in Northern Ireland is to be broken. The UDA said that if the IRA held back, 
Then the outlawed Ulster freedom fighters would not carry out attacks such as yesterday's at a Belfast bookmaker's in which five people were murdered. Security hasn't been as heavy in Belfast for years, but extra anti-terrorist measures put in place yesterday morning couldn't stop the indiscriminate attack on the betting shop. The local community, like many others in the city, is very frightened. Through the day, more and more flowers were placed there, and five candles were put on the doorstep in memory of the murdered relatives, neighbours and friends. The family of 51-year-old Christopher Doherty, like many relatives of the other victims, can't forgive the killers. Hell will never be full to the remit. That's all I can say. A psychopath. What's your reaction to the fact that some people might feel that there needs to be some sort of retaliation for yesterday's... Well, I wouldn't want any retaliation. Although it can say, there's a lot of people who say that, and they're not, these people don't listen to anybody. They just go ahead. But I wouldn't want anybody to do the same thing to happen to them as happened to them. The murders were carried out by the illegal loyalist group, the Ulster Freedom Fighters. For many, they're so close to the legal Ulster Defence Association that, as one nationalist politician said, they're the same men in different balaclavas. The UDA's leadership has been transformed in recent years. The old guard either dead, in prison or expelled by the new men. They're younger, more violent and determined to show they can hit back. The BBC questioned a spokesman for the UDA leadership today. He refused to appear on camera and said he couldn't speak on behalf of the UFF. But he said that if what he called the IRA's genocide against the Protestant community was to stop, then he said he could not see circumstances in which the UFF would carry out attacks anywhere. The paramilitary spokesman repeatedly quoted the murder by the IRA of eight workmen near Cookstown last month as the kind of attack that he said has brought the Protestant community to breaking point. An IRA statement today claimed it would not be drawn into sectarian killings. In other words, they don't see the murder of these eight Protestants as sectarian, rather, as the statement said, as part of a war with British forces. They want people to think their campaign's different, not to the view of the bereaved or of the community at large. IRA attacks will continue, retaliation inevitable, an apparently unbreakable cycle of revenge. Albert Reynolds has been elected to succeed Charles Hockey as Prime Minister of the Irish Republic. Mr Reynolds condemned yesterday's killings in Belfast as dreadful carnage and said he would work with the British government to try to end the cruelty of the conflict. Jim Dougal reports from Dublin. This was Albert Reynolds' day, but for him, yesterday's killings in Belfast cast a shadow over the celebrations. The murders, he said, were the result of a twisted patriotism which sees death as the instrument of change. Is that cruel carnage that has taken place over the last 36 hours must have shocked every decent Irish person, man or woman. And that we should not spare any effort to look in every direction, to take any possible, possible initiative or move to try and put a stop to a situation where we had 27 deaths in the last 36 days. That cannot be ignored. Would you seek an early One of his first actions as Prime Minister, he said, will be to seek urgent talks with John Major. Earlier, on his last day as party leader, Charles Hohey also spoke of the need for a response. If we expect the British authorities to take every possible measure open to them, take all the steps available to them within the law, it's obvious from Mr Reynolds' comments that his government will see the security situation in Northern Ireland as a major priority. There's no question but that this will be welcomed by the authorities in Belfast and London. Jim Dougal, BBC News, Dublin. A hospital in Stoke-on-Trent has admitted giving the wrong treatment to nearly a thousand cancer patients over the last nine years. Patients at the North Staffordshire Royal Infirmary received radiation doses up to 30% below the correct level because of an error by a physicist. Half of those treated have since died, but the hospital denies that the mistake put lives at risk. The North Staffordshire Hospital has blamed human error for the mistake. 
It's thought that over the last nine years, about a thousand patients were given too little radiation with this machine. Some are given up to a third less radiation than the doctors had prescribed. The error came to light when a new computer was being fitted. Physicists realized that the original computer had been wrongly set. The hospital denies lives have been put at risk. We have not noticed any clinical effect over the last 10 years. An independent clinical assessment is being organized to look into each individual case and assess the results of treatment according to the tumor uh, type. Other radiation experts believe some patients may have been harmed. There's a the difference between patients treated to reduce their pain and those doctors are trying to cure. If all the patients were being treated in a palliative setting, he's right. The patients would not have been put at risk. If there are patients being treated for cure, then I would say that these patients are at significant risk. Mrs Lillian Clough's husband, who was treated at North Staffordshire, died of cancer. She is alarmed by what has happened. Well, completely shocked. I just wonder whether my husband's had this treatment and if anything could have been done to save him. He was 54 when he died. It's a bit tragic. It's not the first time wrong doses of radiotherapy have been given. Four years ago, at the Royal Devon and Exeter Hospital, some patients were given 25% too much radiation over a five-month period. Since then, more than 100 patients have been paid a total of over £1 million in damages by the health authority. At North Staffordshire this morning, hospital authorities revealed they had sent out 400 letters to patients explaining what had happened. And the telephone hotline has been set up for relatives of those who have died. Have you had a letter from us? Department of Health experts are investigating to see what lessons can be learned. But cancer doctors say radiotherapy departments need better qualified physicists to avoid similar problems in future. That can only be done by improving their pay and job prospects. A man is being questioned by police in connection with the theft from a solicitor's office of a document relating to an affair between the Liberal Democrat leader Paddy Ashdown and his secretary. The Liberal Democrats campaign manager Des Wilson has joined Labour's call for a coordinated police inquiry into a spate of similar break-ins. The man arrested in Brighton arrived at Snow Hill Police Station in the City of London tonight for questioning over a burglary at Mr Ashdown's solicitors last month. The theft of a document revealing his brief relationship with his former secretary yesterday forced Mr Ashdown to go public about the affair. The woman involved, Tricia Howard, made her first public appearance today and made a statement through her lawyer. She would like to say that she very much hopes that in return for making herself available to be photographed this morning, her family and she will be left alone to live a normal life free from intolerable pressures and intrusions. Thank you very much. Mrs Ashdown was also trying to put the matter behind her, stressing it had been a shock when she originally learned of the affair, but that was all five years ago. The Liberal Democrats themselves want to put a lid on this particular matter, but having compiled a list of other break-ins, they'll be campaigning now for a general investigation. I would like to join the call from some Labour MPs yesterday that there is now a need for a proper, coordinated police inquiry into what is going on. Usually it's lack of publicity which poses a problem for the Liberal Democrats. Today they had more than they wanted. Ashdown! Mr. Uh... At question time, MPs greeted Mr. Ashdown with a sympathetic murmur. He'd been determined to get back to business as usual, refusing offers of a day off. Some felt he looked less confident than usual. In recent times, the Liberal Democrats' popularity has been very closely linked with that of its leader. And some believe the important thing now is not Mr Ashdown's affair, but how well he can bounce back from his current difficulties. Labour has accused the government of inventing a recovery that does not yet exist. During a Commons debate on the economy, Labour's Gordon Brown blamed the recession on Tory economic mismanagement. The Trade and Industry Secretary, Peter Lilly, said Labour's policies would aggravate the recession and told Mr Brown he was overdosing on gloom. One of Labour's main priorities is to connect the recession with the policies of Mr Major. Recent polls suggest that most voters don't blame him for the current economic difficulties. This morning they claimed that while Mr Major and his Chancellor were making optimistic statements about the economy, it was moving deeper into recession. In the Commons, they challenged one of the government's main explanations for the recession, that other countries were facing similar difficulties, and mocked what they saw as the Conservatives' attempt to talk up the economy. And after 13 years of government, 
They are no longer asking, how can they achieve better growth or better investment or better employment prospects? The highest aspiration in government is simply better advertising in the run-up to the election. As well as citing global economic problems, the government argued the recession would be much worse under Labour. The Trade and Industry Secretary, Peter Lilly, accused Mr Brown of playing down Britain's successes. The Honourable Member overdoses on gloom. He can't get enough of it. I fear that eventually it will consume him entirely. But the Liberal Democrats agree with Labour that Mr Major must take some blame for the recession. I mean, John Major, as number two to Nigel Lawson at the Treasury, was there when the credit boom, boom was fuelled, which subsequently led to the brakes being applied and the recession which has affected the country very deeply. Mr Brown's speech has been widely praised, even by some Conservative MPs, which is encouraging news for Labour because if they lose the argument over who's to blame for the recession, they're unlikely to win the election. It's the second time this week that Labour has accused the government of being wrong about their predictions of an end to the recession. But, as our economics correspondent Steve Levinson reports, it's not just the government that's having to revise its forecasts. At the time of the autumn statement last November, the Treasury was relying on consumers to lead the economy out of recession. Now, as the budget approaches, it's clear that's not happened. Economists at institutions highly thought of by the Treasury have had to put their hopes of recovery on ice. Last autumn, they shared the Treasury's optimism about growth. The Treasury then expected the total economy to grow this year by just over 2% and manufacturing output by over 3%. The London Business School's forecasts were almost identical. But new LBS forecasts soon to be published show growth this year will be much weaker, just over 1% overall and even less for manufacturing. Mr Lamont's budget forecast will not be very different. Economists admit they were over-optimistic last year. They underestimated how reluctant consumers would be to spend money. It's an irony that Mr Major, when he was Chancellor, introduced a budget for saving, and that's precisely what households are doing now, increasing their spending. Oh.